Hi everybody, this is John from BioFrontiers IT. This is the last video in the Intro to Compute Cluster video series for the short read sequencing course. Uh, what we're looking at right now is just my terminal. I'm logged into Tortuga. Um, you can see that by running hostname, and I'm verifying that I am me. I like to do this sometimes because I have a lot of terminals open often, and I lose track of where I am and who I am. That sounds bad, but it's just a consequence of uh, moving around a lot. So uh, real quick, going to list the contents of my home directory and just highlight here a file I have called slurmtest.sh. And I'm going to open this file right now in Vim, and we're going to go through it a little bit. So when we submit jobs to the compute cluster um, using Slurm, essentially we tell Slurm about the types of resources we need, how many uh, processors or cores, how much memory we anticipate using, and how long our job is going to take. And then Slurm, when there's room on the cluster, and when it thinks it's appropriate, will uh, basically execute this job for us. So we're going to go through this line-wise. The very first line is called a shebang. And uh, essentially what this does is tells Slurm, or really if you run any script that has a shebang, it tells uh, the shell how to open it or, or what shell it should run in. In this case, I'm specifying bin bash, which is what all of you should use for most of your jobs during the short read course. Um, next line we have this sort of hash sbatch, and this is a special type of comment that we use in our scripts to tell Slurm about the type of uh, resources we need. Um, we tell it the name of our job, as this, this first line indicates. So I just want to go through each of these real quick. So um, the sbatch directives also, it's worth noting, have to go before any commands that you actually run in your job. You couldn't stick one randomly at the bottom of the file or anything like that. So the directives that are in this script will primarily get you through the whole short read course with you know, a little bit of modification depending on what you're doing, but the, the directives themselves that I'm specifying, like job name and mail type and all those things, are more or less what you'll need. So this first one, we can see, you know, again, hash sbatch, and then we have job name equals slurm test. When we run uh, commands to see our job running and whatnot, that's how it'll appear. Um, mail type, uh, we can choose to get email, basically, when our job starts, when it finishes successfully, or when it fails. In my case, I'm specifying all. Please note, if you specify that you want to get mail, you must provide a mail user. If you don't, um, we will get a lot of emails and we will very likely reach out to you and tell you to fix it ASAP because this happens more often than we like. We get a lot of emails that are supposed to be going to other people, but they don't specify the user, so they end up coming to our inbox. Uh, end tasks basically is how many CPUs or cores do we want. In this case, I'm just going to use one. Memory is one gigabyte. Uh, again, that's more than I need for what I'm doing right now, but you could specify something up to 256 gigabytes on Tortuga. Uh, time. This is basically how long you think your job is going to run. Um, people have this tendency to specify some outlandish time, like, you know, nine days for something that will actually finish in 10 minutes. It seems like that's the safe thing to do, but it actually really hurts everyone because the scheduler uses this time to try to... Uh, anticipate when it might be able to run a job or when a job might finish. So the more accurate you can be with your wall time, uh, it's actually going to make the cluster sort of a better place for everybody. And I know that sounds a little uh, cliche maybe, but uh, it's true. Uh, we have seen sort of ill effects from people specifying huge wall times for jobs that finish very quickly in that uh, the scheduler just gets kind of tripped up and jobs don't go through as quickly as they should and everything else. Uh, the last line here, sbatch output, this is specifying where my standard output and error should be written. Um, also, I have a variable in this line. This is something that Slurm knows to insert my job ID here. So I could run this five times, and because I'd have a unique job ID every time, uh, this percent %j will be replaced by a unique number each time, which means that I can keep writing to the same location, but since that number is there and it's different, it's not going to overwrite the old files. It's going to keep making a new file with that job ID. Uh, you can also separate your error and output files. I don't personally like to do that because I um, sometimes standard error and standard output are written at the same time. So having them in one file means uh, you can see them sort of side by side as they're getting written. And sometimes that's a little bit more helpful in my opinion. So again, your sbatch directives have to be at the top of the script. And then below them, once you're done, 
any commands that you want to run can be in this file. Um, if you wanted to do some operations like in your homework for day two, like um, catting files and whatnot, you could do that as a job on the compute cluster rather than doing it interactively. In my case, I'm going to uh, print my present working directory. I'm going to print my host name. Uh, sometimes I like to print host name at the beginning of every job anyway, because then you'll know which compute node it ran on. This can sometimes be helpful for troubleshooting in case there's an issue with one of the compute nodes. Uh, I'm going to run the date. Then I'm going to echo you've requested. And then I have another variable that uh, Slurm will populate with how many CPUs I have. I'm going to sleep for, uh, I'm going to change this from 600 seconds to 6 seconds. And then I'm going to run date again. So I'm going to write and quit this file. I can cat this file just to be sure that it looks as I'd expect. And now what I want to do is submit this. So what I can do to submit a job is type sbatch and then slurm test.sh. Obviously, you'd replace, replace sorry, slurm test with whatever you actually want to run on the compute nodes. And when I do this, slurm is going to kick back a little message that says submitted batch job 594. Now I can type sq and I'll see my job running. I can see the job ID. It's running in the compute partition. I can see the name, again, defined by one of those sbatch uh, sort of directives at the top. st is for state. It's running. Time, it's been running for five seconds. And I can see it's running on tort node 01, which is the first compute node. If I run sq again, at this point, the job is finished. So what I'd expect to see is basically the file um, from the job, slurm test, then you can see where I had percent %j got overwritten with the job ID, or replaced, dot out. So if I cat that file now, I can see all my commands. The first command that I ran in my script was pwd. Then I ran hostname. Then I ran date. Uh, then I ran an echo. And I wanted to print out the number of cores I had. And then I ran date again. And if you recall, uh, before I ran date the second time, I had sleep 6. So if you look at the timestamp here and the timestamp here, what you'll see is there was indeed a 6 second sleep in there. So let's do one more thing here. Let's modify the Slurm test script. Let's change our wall time to uh, 5 minutes. And let's change our sleep to 10 minutes. Why are we doing this? Well. Um, if I ran this, I'm not going to make you sit here for you know five minutes, but if I ran this, um, what I would see is that this job would actually fail when it exited. It would have a non-zero exit status. And that's because I would run out of wall time since I only asked for five minutes before my sleep was able to actually finish. But I'm still going to run this because I want to show you something else. So if I run sbatch slurm test.sh, I can now see submitted batch job 595. That's my job number. I can run sq and see that it's running. Uh, slightly different output is if I type qstat. It looks fairly similar, but it does have a few historical jobs. Um, I'm not sure the exact time that it will show jobs that recently finished, but uh, I think it's something on the order of maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So under s here, I can see this job 594 has c for complete, and the one under it has r for running. Uh, I can also say qstat-u, jode 5573 that's my identity key, and it'll only show me jobs that belong to me, which at this point nobody else is running jobs anyway. But if there were a whole bunch of jobs and I wanted to filter it to just mine, that's how I would do that. And last but not least, let's say I realize now that job 595, uh, I made a mistake when I submitted it. I know that it's not going to exit cleanly, so I actually want to just kill the job. I don't want it to run. I want to cancel it so that I can fix my mistake and then resubmit. Well, for that, we use the scancel command. And what scancel does is basically uh, it will remove a job from the queue. It will terminate what's happening. And now if I run sq, you can see my job is no longer there. Um, so that's sort of the basics here. I think the last thing I'd point out is uh, how do we see information about a historical job, a job that already ran but we want to follow up on? Um, in Slurm, it's a little bit wonky, but there's this command sjobexitmod. And if I do dash L and then my job ID, I can actually see my job ID. Um, if you're under an account with us, you'll see account there. You all probably have something blank. Uh, 
the number of nodes that I had, the node list, the state of the job. Uh, this was the one that I canceled, and you can see here it says that I canceled it. Because I canceled it, it had an exit status or an exit code of zero. And um, if there were anything more, it might be here under comment. So hopefully that's all helpful. Um, if you have any questions, I would encourage you to reach out to bithelp at colorado.edu to get a hold of the BioFrontiers IT team or ask one of the TAs for the short read course.